uh, video and audio recorded. Uh, sound, please make sure that you mute yourself when watching the presentation. Uh, the video, we rec recommend that viewers put the screen into speaker view mode um, and all questions will be added to the chat for today's uh, commentary. Please send this chat uh, question in a private chat directly to myself, uh, Mr. Trey Reed, uh, by selecting Trey Reed in the TO field in the chat box. So that's the two field in the lower right. Right now, and by default, it should show everyone. Um, but if you drop down the arrow, you should see my name and direct all questions directly to me. Participation. Uh, when there is time for discussion, please raise your hand physically or with a reaction button on the lower right hand side of uh, the share button or manage participants. Um, I will call on you by name. Um, if you have a question in the chat, I will um, read your question to the young ladies and they will answer to the best of their ability. Thank you. Okay, so once again, I am Eliza Locks. And I'm Adora Dadson. Hey. And our presentation is about medication and electrical stimulation. Does brain hacking make us less human? So to begin, we are going, everyone is going to be completing a poll. Um, this is just to get a general idea of everyone's understanding on these topics and everyone's opinions. Okay, great. I'll give it a few more minutes, a few more seconds or so for everyone to complete. Also, feel free to elaborate in the comments if you would like to say more about why you chose your option, especially if you choose other on one of them. Okay, I'm gonna end it here. I know some people still haven't voted, but um, the, the responses are actually pretty interesting. So um, I'm gonna share the results here. So as you can see, most people said that the definition of human is that the possession of mind and consciousness, which, and they also said that the biggest part of human experience is learning, which really shows how right now we're really focused on education and being able to learn and adapt to our situations. and for number three, most people said pain is essential to the human experience, which is actually a lot more than I expected. So that's going to be interesting as we continue on our presentation. And then the majority of people said that no, they would not completely eliminate pain from their lives, which once again, um, is also really important to our topic. So thank you. Okay, great. Now that I have an uh, idea of everyone's opinions, we um, I'm going to pass it on to Adora to give you a little bit background of background on her topic. 
Okay, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit more about what are. So, a neural network is a system that has the ability to stimulate different parts of the brain. Sorry, it says my audio isn't working correctly. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. That's the door. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, okay, so it stimulates different parts of the brain and nervous system. It uses electrical pulses to regulate brain activity. And by doing this, it's by different diseases. Certain which is already the way that no Okay, um, I think let's just give it a minute, but yeah, I'm sorry about that. But I'm actually gonna go back and I think before Adora shares about her, um, her part, we should go back to the, the central ethical question that is part of both of our presentations, which is, to what extent is it ethical for humans to take away pain or disability through brain hacking methods, such as medication and neural implants? And by brain hacking, we're talking about any type of alteration that somehow changes your central nervous system or your brain or something along those lines, such as the two topics such as our two topics. Now we're going to try again with Adora. Sorry about that. Um, wait, it seems like she's trying to fix it. So Adora, do you want me to just go first then? Will you figure it out? Yes, please. Eliza, can you go first? And yes. I'm going to fix my wifi right now. Great. So sorry. No, you're all good. Okay. Give me one sec. Okay, great. So I'm going to give some background on my presentation first then. So before you can understand the ethical issues with eliminating pain and connected to Adora's topic, you should understand some of the science and history behind it. So how does pain work? So pain is actually essential to our survival and function as human beings. It's generally split into two different kinds of pain, which is neur neuropathic, which is nociceptive and neuropathic pain. So right now, I'm mostly going to focus on neuroceptive pain because it is the one that everyone is more familiar with. So the way that works is that we have nociceptors at our nerve endings. And the nociceptors have a range of acceptable heat and a range of acceptable pressure. So when an external noxious stimulus outside of the acceptable range comes in contact with the nociceptor, it sends electrical signals through the nerves to the brain. So you can see that through the picture, there's a heat stimulus. It sends electrical signals through the, the nerves and through the peripheral nerve and into the brain. So I'm gonna give an example. Let's say you put your hand over a fire. You, that's within the acceptable range of heat. So you can feel the fires there, but your body won't react. Whereas if you stick your hand into the fire, your body will send a response through your nerves into your brain and you'll pull the hand away. Same thing for a knife. If you're holding the knife at the end, um, you'll feel that it's in your hand, but it's inside of the acceptable range. Whereas if you're holding it on the sharp part and it pierces your skin, that's too much pressure. So your body will know that and you'll, it'll, you'll react. So you can see from that why it is so important for us to have pain to protect us. And since pain is so important, philosophers and scientists throughout history have um, have had different viewpoints and definitions for it. So starting with Aristotle. In the fourth, around the fourth century BC in ancient Greece, Aristotle was a really famous philosopher. So he described pain as the passion of the soul. Obviously here he was talking more about emotional pain, but it's still clear that he looked pretty at as a pretty positive and natural thing. Then in the Middle Ages, um, around the fourth century AD, the idea of Cyrenaicism emerged. And it's based on the idea that wise people should avoid pain at all costs. And this was a more negative and fearful outlook on pain than Aristotle's. 
Then skipping ahead to the early 20th century, a famous neurobiologist named Sir Charles Scott Sherrington um, dedicated most of his life's research to defining pain. And eventually he came out with the definition that is a physical adjunct of a re re uh, of protective reflex. So once again, that shows how necessary pain is to our functioning. And he basically made that definition that you saw in the previous slide. Then in the 19, so in the 1970s, because of people like Sherrington and Aristotle, doctors were taught to use the patient's pain to gauge the severity of their illness. So in pain management centers, patients would work, be worked with to figure out a way to manage their pains and get their lives back despite the chronic pain that they had. And pain relievers that were prescribed were usually much more mild and harsh ones were only prescribed very rarely and only in the most extreme situations. And but in the 1990s, um, Dr. Kevorkian sparked a conversation about pain and dying and, de and death and with dignity all around the world. So Dr. Kevorkian was a doctor who helped patients end their life and was eventually put in jail for his actions. His, his um, treatment was extremely controversial and although it helped many people, it also contributed to the shift in how doctors treated and thought about pain, which led to a lot more fear and avoidance, similar to what we saw with sirenicism in the 14th century. And that all brings us to today. Um, because in the 1990s, it became easier to get opioids due to less restrictions and due to this fear of pain, um, because they originally didn't think opioids were addicted at all. So when patients, so it made it easier for patients to steal large amounts of pills and become addicted. But in recent years, this has been proven. This is proven to definitely not be true. Um, and so that leads to, to that. So today with our focus on eliminating and our negative outlook on pain, there has been an, a big opioid, a big spark in the availability of opioids, which leads to the opioid epidemic, which I will touch on later. But something that this also led to was pain as the fifth vital sign. So all this history leads up to how did we get here? So the fifth vital sign is the vitals that they take when you go to the doctor or the hospital. So the first one is body temperature, second pulse, third respiratory rate, and fourth blood pressure. And finally, fifth, the newest one, pain. So something interesting about all of these is that the first four are all very concrete. They can be measured with numbers, with machines, but pain is entirely subjective and it's, it's recorded based on the person who's relaying the information that they are in pain. So they've created this scale to try to establish um, a central way to evaluate pain, but since it's so subjective, it's not entirely effective. And that complicates ethical issues involved. So um, to bring it back to you guys, how many of you have ever been asked to rate your pain um, when you were in the emergency room, urgent care, just going to the doctor's office? Um, this is just a rhetorical question, so just think about this for a moment. So when you were asked to rate your pain, what did you expect to happen next? I mean, I'm going to assume that you expect the doctor to actually treat that pain. And because of that expectation, once again, that leads to the opioid epidemic. So in 2018, 10.3 million people misused prescription opioids. That's in just one year alone. And to put that in some context, um, New York City has roughly 8.5 million people as the population of the entire city, all five boroughs. So the amount of people addicted to opioids in that one year was the population of New York plus 2 million more. So that just shows the extent of this epidemic and the issues with fearing pain. Um, so now I'm going to give it back to Adora and hopefully it'll work out this time. Um, here we go. Okay, so sorry everyone, I moved places, so the Wi-Fi should be working fine on my part. Okay, so I'm just gonna restart. So 
As I mentioned before, a neural implant is a very small implantable technological system that has the ability to stimulate different parts of the brain and nervous system. It uses electrical pulses to regulate brain activity, and by doing this, neural implants can aid or restart neurons that have been affected by different neurodegenerative diseases. Certain types of modern implants are still being tested and tried, but some that you might be familiar with already are cochlear implants and deep brain stimulation, which is an implant that has been already used by many Parkinson's patients. DBS has a brain part and a battery pack, as shown in the picture, that is usually implanted around the shoulder, shoulder region, which is connected by a wire that flows throughout the body. Now, the way that neural implants work is pretty complex. So the machine would be implanted by a neurosurgeon in a certain part of the brain, depending on the certain disease that the implant will try to target. The outer layer of the implant is flexible and soft, so it's less likely to cause a foreign body response in the brain. The neural implant basically acts like a translator to aid the brain it, to send signals to different areas. With access to our nerve cells, the implants can collect and analyze our brain activity through microelectrocorticography system so that this message that the brain is trying to create is sent to the right part of the brain. This especially helps damage nerves and tissues and aids brain trauma. In the case that a patient has been affected by a neurodegenerative disease, which causes their brain cells to mess up, the machine can actually change the natural brain that the brain natural way that the brain is used to working, which is wrong in this case, by overriding the damaged and confused neurons, they can be restarted to become active again, or they can change the message that actually makes sense. Additionally, neural implants can aid our, aid our neurons by acting like neurotransmitters in our brain. So neurotransmitters are responsible for critical processes in our bodies, such as breathing and muscle movement. With neural implants helping transmitters, it can also work hand in hand with neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is a process in which your brain pathways change based on environmental, neural, and behavioral changes over the course of our lifetimes. It uses synaptic pruning to delete connections that haven't been used in order to have energy to strengthen other connections that are being used more frequently. Neural implants can make neuroplasticity more efficient and can allow for more motor control recovery, which is always a concern with brain injuries. One of the main diseases that utilizes implants to help in alleviating symptoms is Parkinson's disease. This is a neurodegenerative disease that has many symptoms with some being paralysis and shaking. In diseases such as Parkinson's or levels of dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter which helps with learning memory and being happy, can decrease creating some effects in your body such as coordination issues and tremors. But with the neural implant being utilized, it can regulate the amount of dopamine produced and make sure that it's up to normal levels. The best part of it is that it wouldn't hurt the patient at all because it would just be helping the brain act like it's supposed to. For a real life example, I wanted to compare two patients that have Parkinson's and what their experience has been with neural implants or without. In the picture, you will see my grandpa Lawrence who has had Parkinson's for over 25 years. He's paralyzed, barely able to talk, and my grandmother has to take care of him for every day-to-day -day need. Even though he has trouble speaking, he has always tried his hardest to communicate no matter how many times it takes. Unfortunately, the use of any type of neural implant was never available to him. Similarly, Eliza actually has a great uncle, Will Wetzel, who is also diagnosed with Parkinson's. He was able to consult with a doctor and had the opportunity to receive deep brain stimulation in 2013. Before he had gotten the procedure, he had had trouble writing, eating, and had tremors in both of his arms. Once the machine was implanted and turned on, his tremors were immediately suppressed. He felt a surge of restored confidence in himself and was able to gain a lot of independence since he was now able to do day-to-day -day activities by himself. Mr. Wetzel is very grateful for the surgery and his life has benefited greatly so from it. So as you can see, a contrast from my grandpa with even though he's happy, needs people around him at all times to help him with everything, and Eliza's great uncle who has greatly benefited from this type of neural implant, which has improved his quality of life. Currently, different companies such as Neuralink, which is Elon Musk's new company, Facebook, and DARPA, which is an agency a part of the government, have started to create their own neural implants with various abilities spanning from helping brain injuries to being able to type with your mind. A lot of the testing for implants has mainly been used on rats and monkeys, but human testing is supposed to be conducted as early as the end of this year.
With DARPA, they want to focus specifically on helping neural prosthetics and using neural implants to connect with artificial limbs in order to actually make it feel like you have a real arm or leg. They're also toying with the idea of using brain implants to help military personnel that have had PTSD for more and with prosthetic memory to help expand how much we're able to remember in a short amount of time. Okay, now we are going to move on to the ethics part of our presentation. So after getting a good understanding of both of our projects and how they work separately, now we're going to start thinking about the ethical implications of taking away pain. Going back to the polling questions in the beginning, we'll further examine how we think pain plays a role in our lives and how taking away could possibly cause more harm than good. When looking at a uh, issue with an ethical framework, we first want to examine who could be affected and these people are known as stakeholders. The stakeholders involved in the use of neural implants and medicine are doctors, which is including nurses and surgeons as they are the ones prescribing you the medicine or inserting the implant. Also pharmaceutical companies and manufacturers of neural implants because they are essentially responsible for putting the product out there so any negative effects could be traced back to their design. Additionally, society, because the ethical issues that come about now can set a precedent for how we utilize medication and neural implants for times to come. All these stakeholders are really important, but they revolve around the main stakeholder, which is ultimately the patients using the pills or the implant, because they're the ones being directly affected by these brain hacking devices. With our project, there are a lot of values that come into play, but we felt the main ones that are especially important are responsibility, identity, and what it means to be human. So when thinking about responsibility, I wanted to think about it with the view of three of our stakeholders, uh, the patient, ourselves, families, and society. So what is our responsibility to ourselves and our families? So when I first thought about this, I thought about how much pain should we have to endure before an implant or a medication is used. Extreme pain and disability can affect capability and cannot allow us to think straight as been scientifically proven, but what is the limit? How much pain should we have to endure on a day-to-day -day basis before we decide to take medication? How much should we suffer from these debilitating diseases before we can decide that we're going to get a neural implant. Just to make a clarification, pain and disability can be different. There's a huge, huge range of pain and it's very subjective versus disability, which can also range, but disability doesn't necessarily have to be synonymous with pain. Therefore, it doesn't have to be like Disability doesn't have to be painful, so I'm not trying to say that they're the same thing. So from having a headache to having chronic back pain, we are the judges of our own pain tolerance, so we do have to decide for ourselves um, what our limit is and when we should reach out and ask for medication or neural implants. I also think of responsibility as a strain on familial relationships. So uh, certain disabilities could have major lifestyle effects on the rest of the family. A small example could be getting a ramp or having to adjust the whole schedule of the family to cater to the one disabled individual. Also, there's a lot of money that can go into taking care of a disabled person. So it could be financially draining with multiple doctor's appointments, keeping up um, with new surgeries possibly, but with neural implants, it can be a long-term investment. So rather than paying a lot over time, it is like one procedure that is, that's all you pay. Certain disabilities can also put a strain on getting to know a person. So if they're paralyzed or have lost the ability to speak, it can be harder to interact with them and get to know them properly as a human and who they are. What is the responsibility of the doctor in terms of giving out medicine and or giving a patient a neural implant? So obviously the health of a patient comes first and the doctor wants to make sure that, that the patient is healthy and can have a good as quality of life as they can. In some cases, if a doctor prescribes you medication, it is less harmful than other drugs. This, an example of that would be taking ibuprofen or Tylenol for a toothache for a few days or a minor surgery. But it can get to the point where if a person feels like they have extreme pain, they could be prescribed something heavier, such as opioids, as Eliza talked about in the beginning. It is easy to get addicted to these types of harder drugs because they are very effective in taking away pain and making you feel good. It is at the responsibility of the doctor to give a patient a medicine or neural implant to make them feel good enough to live their daily lives but at the same time prevent them from a possible drug addiction later on in their lifetime. 
what is the responsibility to society? So when I think of this, I think of the future of pain treatment. As I said before, with society as a stakeholder, it could, it could set a precedent for what we do with pain later in our lives. And it can also create a jumping off point for future innovations. For example, medication has actually kind of served as a jumping off point for neural implants because they have kind of combined powers and made neural implants have the ability to send out certain medicine or drugs to the brain, which has mainly helped with um, preventing epilepsy and seizures. I feel like with this responsibility to society, we will definitely be using the fifth vital chart more as Eliza showed, and maybe it will be a way to figure out if there's a certain amount of pain we, should, we have to be at on the scale in order to take a certain medication or in, in order to get an implant to kind of draw the line between when we should use medication and when we shouldn't. Will we become a med happy society? Are we already one now? So this med happy society is an ironic term, which means that we're a society that overuses medication, but it doesn't mean that medication makes us happier. So it's kind of an ironic term. Um, I know that I'm a victim of this, but whenever I have the slightest bit of pain, I immediately resort to taking, thinking about taking medication. Obviously pain medication is more widely available to the public than neural implants. So it's easier to gravitate to medicine to handle your pain, even if it's the slightest thing like a little headache. But the question comes up is, do we need to take medicine for every single time we feel the littlest bit of pain? Is it okay for humans to feel pain sometimes naturally? When should we wait it out and when do we have to take medication? So this also goes back to pain tolerance and to what extent should we have to suffer and before we consider taking medication or neural implants. Okay, now I'm going to pass it on to Eliza, who's going to talk more about what it means to be human. Okay, great. So another value that we have to consider is staying true to what it means to be human. So first of all, there's their idea of playing God, which comes up in a lot of ethical issues in terms of changing your body and is really important in, um, in, and what it means to be human in the brave new world. So playing God means, do you have too much control over changing your natural state or, you know, what God is supposed to make you be according to religions? And this can also lead to the slippery slope argument, which means that if we can change our brain, if we can alter our brain, but with medication and neural implants to reduce pain or to ease suffering from disability, what's next? Will we be able to use neural implants just to send text with our minds or do things that aren't considered necessary? Which goes back to Adora's point on one of the previous slides about how much pain do we have to endure to be able to get use of this, to have use of this technology. The next part is, does the medical alteration have too much power? So, in, in some sense, it's you versus the medical alteration. Because there have been cases where people's moods and emotions have dramatically changed. Um, just have dramatically changed just due to having a neural implant or due to taking medication. So is it okay for them to have so much power, for this thing to have so much power over you? And are you still human if it does? And then, and, and this causes a loss of autonomy, meaning you have less control over your own situation. Finally, okay. Um, but there's also the question of, are you staying true to your human nature? Which brings us to our identity. So your identity is something that changes throughout our whole lives and it changes how we experience our lives and our world. And um, having an illness or being, having chronic pain can play a part in your identity. So for example, if you have a disability, people consider that part of your identity. If you have a mental illness, that can also be a consideration. And once again, this brings us back to staying true to our human nature. If we are putting something inside our body that changes, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that can change our emotions or our characteristics, is that staying true to our human nature? So to give you an example of how much a person can change, um, there is a case where someone got a neural implant and they, um, they became addicted to gambling. And this is totally outside of that person's 
usual char- their usual characteristics. But now they had this addiction and it changed their relationship with their families. And the same thing can be true for someone who's addicted to opioids. So are we staying true to our human nature? And is that changing our relationships with other people by getting um, this type of medical alteration? And is it also staying true to our identity and who we are and who we are naturally? Okay, so now that we gave you all this information, we want you to have a chance to um, think about it. But first, Adora and I are gonna share our own opinions. So Adora, you can go first. Okay, so from my experience of working with neural implants over the past few months and also collaborating with Eliza these past few weeks, kind of before winter, um, sorry, spring break, I've learned so much about the brain and about all these new innovations in science and medicine and specifically for neural implants. I've learned what they are. I didn't even think that there was a possibility that they could ever exist. I can only see them in movies and stuff like that. So having the chance to research it and think about the ethics behind it, I think is really important since it is such a new innovation. It's very important to think before we do and kind of think about every possible consequence and how we can kind of minimize that in order to make it safe for the public. Eliza? Um, yeah, I'd say I'm on a similar page to Adora because through this, I really learned the importance of in our brave new world, staying true to our human nature and to um, making sure we stay with our stick with our definition of what it means to be human. And this is definitely true when you're altering. Um, yeah, when you're just altering your brain or altering a central part of your nervous system. So now I'm going to open that up to you. So if you have any questions or if you want to answer any of the questions on this slide, um, as Mr. Reed says, post it um, and send it to him and he will say it out loud. Oh, we know that it'll take a second. So yeah. it's fine. <laughs> Also, um, I'll just, I'll read the questions out loud. So do you believe, this is all going back to the polling questions at the beginning. So I would be interested to see if your opinion has changed. So do you believe that pain is essential to the human experience? Do you think that the benefit of using neural implants and or pain medication outweighs the ethical risks? And for which situations should medication or neural implants be used? Should it only be used for disabilities or should it be used for minor inconveniences or pain? Uh, we actually have a question here. Um, it's in regards to Adore's uh, topic. Uh, Adore, what's your opinion on neural implants? Uh, do you support the use of them or do you not? Um, well, from doing my research, I finally came up with the opinion which I expressed in my paper that I do believe that they should be used, especially in the medical sense, because I feel like it's such a strong innovation that could really push forward the lives of many people, people with Parkinson's, people, they've been testing neural implants with epilepsy, depression, all these different diseases where medication in some cases hasn't worked or therapy hasn't worked. And so having this new innovation, I feel like it's very important. Um, In contrast, people talking about neural implants for recreational purposes. So like sending texts with your mind and stuff like that, I feel like could be a cool innovation, but I feel like it should definitely be second priority to people who actually need it. It's kind of a need versus or necessity versus luxury kind of idea. So using it for medicine, I feel like it is very good. And I I like that, but um, using it for recreational, it's fine. But once again, keep it second priority too. What's really the problem. Have you noticed if there's been any cases in humans where some sort of uh, neural implants have majorly failed? Uh, Majorly failed. I haven't seen anything in my research about majorly failed. Um, I have seen a few negative effects, like a few psychological effects, such as a little bit of a change in personality. So like being, um, having some gambling addiction, people have created that or kind of making random decisions, stuff like that. But I haven't seen anything that has um, like completely changed somebody's life in a negative way. So no. Okay, um, Eliza, uh, can you give a defense as to why we should stay true to our human nature? And can humans craft their own uh, new kind of nature, which redefines pain? Yeah, so that. 
Oh. Eliza, your mic. There we go. <laughs> that is something I've been thinking a lot about lately, and I do not have a definitive answer. But I'd like to throw it back to the audience, so if anyone wants to put their own opinion about that out there, I would appreciate it. But personally, I think that it is really important to stay true to who we're meant to be in, as humans, because it can get dangerous if we stray too far away from that. What's the best way to make a decision when the patient's family's request for pain medicine or neural implants diverge from what the doctors think is best for the particular situation? Um, I feel like the family's opinion is very, very important, but at the end of the day, uh, personally, I do feel like the doctor is the expert and they do want to do what's best for you or what can be best for you to give you a better life. So I feel like um, an ideal situation, you would want the family and the doctor to agree on what's best for the patient. But um, there can be times where the family wants to move in a different direction. And I feel like the doctor should respect that um, as they're kind of the people closely connected to the patient. So even if they don't agree with the best way, they should still agree with the family. Um, what are the dangers of larger use of implants to control behavior more than simple pain? Um, the larger use of implants, I talked about this. Um, there could be possible privacy concerns. I expanded more on this in my paper, but um, if we make neural implants more mainstream and available to the public, it can kind of come up with a question similar to how people can hack a computer. Can we hack brain implants. And obviously with such close access to our brain and our thoughts, it could be a much more intimate kind of abuse of a neural implant. So that is um, one type of danger that could definitely has to be think, thought about before we continue on. Okay. Um, tying into a different ethical value of justice, how do you think the social implications of neural implants will play out? If getting implants is expensive and time consuming, mainly the wealthy few, and by extension, chiefly white people, will have access to them. Do you foresee a further racial divide as a result of limited availability to wow. neural implants? Hey, you guys are asking all the questions that I know the answers to. Well, not the answers to, but I have some type of <laughs> answer. But um, I talked about a possible socioeconomic divide with, um, I've seen cost of neural implants be thousands and thousands of dollars. And what can happen in the future when a family gives their child a neural implant to possibly get ahead in school, being the gifted program, versus another family who's unfortunately not able to provide that. Um, one of my solutions that I thought was definitely getting insurance companies involved and in kind of having a certain type of coverage for it, especially for people who who would need it. So people with a disability or people with extreme pain, like definitely take away some of that money would get a, get take away the burden overall. So I can't see it having a socioeconomic divide. And I don't, I personally don't know how that can be solved, but definitely in the future, that is something that we have to think about so that we don't divide kind of the haves and the have nots. Okay, uh, next question is for Eliza. Um, would you say that pain's subjectiveness can, in some scenarios, harm a patient? For example, if the patient believes they can handle more pain than they really can, do you think there's a way a doctor could grasp a patient's true pain level and act without patient direction? If not, how do you think this could affect the outcome, the patient's health and life? Um, so short answer is definitely it goes both ways. So the doc, the the patient could say they're in more pain than they really are, but they can also say they're in less pain than they really are. What's the second part of the question? Uh, second part of the question is, uh, uh, do you think there is a way that the doctor could grasp a patient's true pain level? Yeah, so as of right now, there isn't, but um, I definitely think that's something that they should be do more research in, and I'm thinking they could probably do something with the way that it's transmitted, but once it, that's also only for um, nociceptive pain and not for neuropath neuropathic pain, but I definitely want to do more research on that. And um, what's the last part? Uh, the last part states, um, if not, how do you think this could affect the outcome, the patient's health and life? If, if they can't figure out a way to make it not subjective. Um, well, as I said, it can lead to addiction. It can lead to being left in pain without wanting to, um, like being left in pain without proper treatment. 
So that can have a long-term outcome. Okay, uh, you mentioned neural implants have been used to treat PTSD. Have these been successful since PTSD has both uh, physiological and uh, psychological symptoms? Um, so the work with neural implants and PTSD is being kept very, very under wraps since it is part of DARPA, which is a government funded project. So there's not really very much research available to the public about it yet, but um, they have started definitely testing that idea and making it a possibility specifically for veterans who have gone through war. Um, I feel like it would more take care of the psychological effect and kind of try to find a way to counteract that trigger, whatever triggers that PTSD to possibly use the neural implant to counteract it so it doesn't like go through. In terms of the physical effects, I'm not sure how much neural implants can help with that, but I feel like in the future, neural implants can successfully um, figure out the, neuro the psychological part of it. Okay. Um, in medical use, what are the guidelines for thresholds since pain is so subjective? Um, currently, it is mostly based off of the individual doctor who is determining that and also the diagnosis. But the issue with that is that even if you have the same diagnosis as someone, there can be a wide range of actual pain. So I want to do more research on that. Okay. Uh, last question. Um, and then we're going to have you girls wrap up, uh, would be, uh, would an implant that imp, uh, eliminated emotional pain, such as the kind of felt as a bad breakup or death of a friend, what considerations would change with the question about human nature? Uh, so we kind of talked about the idea of good versus bad. This is obviously a very big spectrum, but in this case, good memories or emotions versus bad memories and emotions. So personally, I do feel that you need the bad to counteract the good. If it was all kind of just on a straight plane, you wouldn't feel any highs or lows. It would just be, it would be the same always. So with stuff such as a breakup and stuff like that, I'm not exactly sure how well, personally, I don't think it would be better to eliminate those because they kind of build your character and make you who you are and really appreciate those high moments, which is obviously part of the human experience, experiencing those highs and lows of life. So I feel like the use of neuro implants, it can become a possibility to take away the bad memories if you want to. But I think the more feasible and accurate way to kind of keep living as close to human nature and human life as you can is to kind of keep all of those memories and have them to build up who you are and make your character. So, yeah. Awesome answer. Um, Eliza and Adora, thank you for your time today. Um, thank you for sharing your research with us. Um, and definitely uh, those that ask uh, very informative questions, we thank you for that. And we thank you all for your time today. Yeah. yeah, thanks everyone so much for engaging and being here and asking really difficult questions, which is important. Yeah, thank you guys. We really appreciate it. We've been working on this for weeks and weeks, and yeah. we're so fortunate to be able to have a virtual symposium. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't have the real one. So thank you guys for making the effort and coming out today. Awesome. Great. Thank you. See you all later.